We are coming on the air tonight with a huge number of Americans on the roads and in the air for the long holiday weekend. The TSA says it's screening a record number of people and it's rolling out new facial recognition at airports to make the lines move faster. But what the serious privacy concerns are, we're going to get into that. We're live at the San Francisco airport for you. Plus, new numbers out on the job market showing the unemployment rate ticking up. Why that could be a good thing for the fight against inflation and what's what and what it means for your wallet. And in the original tonight, something that will probably surprise you, oil-rich Texas is leading the country in solar and wind power. Will that stop future power meltdowns fueled by climate change? Also, the weight loss drug Wagovi and Ozempic successful. We know that, but they are basically reshaping the economy of an entire country now. I'll tell you what's going on in Denmark. And college football kicks off this weekend. And you'll have to keep your eye on the ball to track what team is in which conference. With two more schools leaving the Pac-12 and just two teams left, will it even exist next season? Hey, everybody, I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Halley tonight. And with the final weekend of the summer upon us, one in three Americans is getting ready to squeeze in one last vacation. Something like 95 million of us plan to travel. Take a look at some of the traffic. This is piling up on highways all across the country now. Or take a look at the packed crowds at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. Our transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg, was there in the last couple of hours. This weekend is capping what TSA reports is the busiest summer travel period on record. The most air travel passengers that have been screened by TSA in American history. So if you're going by car, the good news is this. Your wallet won't get hit harder. Gas prices are steady right now, up only about four cents over the last month, up just a penny from last year. Travel is up 4% from last Labor Day, but get ready for lines if you're taking a plane, though. International travel, that's up 44%, especially to the cities you see on your screen here. We're talking about Vancouver, Rome, London, Dublin, and Paris. And today, we also had some close calls, like at Reagan National Airport outside D.C. Air traffic control had to wave off a Delta flight because another plane was taking off from the same runway. Nobody was hurt. Now, to make travel smoother this weekend, the TSA says it's going to scan your face. It's rolling out new facial recognition technology at 27 airports. Some people have serious concerns with that because they say it's not clear when people's privacy is protected or being invaded. And with systems like this, it's very hard to do that because the uh, people who are building the surveillance technology and this sort of applies across the board, whether you're talking about the government or private industry, are doing so in a way that makes the privacy protections opaque and really difficult for people to understand and access. Jake Ward is at one of those airports we talked about. He's in San Francisco for us today. So, Jake, this is sort of a sign of the times, I guess. Explain to us how this tech is going to work and, and why the TSA thinks it's necessary now. Well, Aaron, in the old days, you had a TSA agent, a human, stand in front of you, look at your driver's license or passport, and then look at your face and make that comparison. I asked the TSA, why is it that you need to move away from that system and into this new one? Here's how they described it. It's not very secure, to be honest with you. If machines do it much better than the humans do, and there's multiple studies out there that, that prove that. Um, it also enhances the passenger experience, too. The idea here is just to not only make it so much more accurate than humans can accomplish on their own, Aaron, it's also because the record number of passengers create, of course, a constraint problem for TSA. So you can sort of understand that perspective on this, right? But there are people who have concerns about what this technology is going to do. It's gotten to the point where even members of Congress have expressed some, some of their worries, right? That's right. Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon says that he's tried to say no at Reagan Airport several times to this process and has in the end been told either it's mandatory or been sort of treated in a very different way. Uh, he was quite upset about it. So uh, when I asked him what his message is to Americans traveling this weekend who maybe don't want to participate in this, here's how he responded. 
if you're directed before a camera, you have the option to not participate. So exercise that option. Say, no, I'd rather just hand you the card. They will just say, and they'll just look at you like you're crazy and, and say, no, just step in front of the camera. And you say, no, I prefer not to. Here's my driver's license. Just know you have that power. Now, TSA says that it is entirely voluntary. And if you get any trouble from a TSA agent when you're traveling this weekend, ask to speak to a supervisor. You have every right to opt out of this area. All right, some good information there. Good to know. Jake Ward for us at San Francisco International. Jake, thank you. Well, Florida rushing to clean up the damage and restore power for nearly 100,000 customers after Hurricane Idalia pummeled the state's northwest coast, the strongest hurricane to hit that area in more than 100 years. And people there who are starting to assess the damage face new questions about whether they'll get the federal aid they need or even if FEMA has enough money to actually help. And that's because FEMA is putting out a new warning that the country's disaster relief fund will run out in just the next two weeks. So let's bring in Guad Venegas now in Horseshoe Beach, Florida, right near where the storm made landfall in the Big Bend there. So Guad, uh, talk to us about what people on the ground there are telling you. How concerned are they about actually getting the help they need? Uh, Aaron, we're about 30 miles away from where the hurricane made landfall. The, the residents here that I've spoken to today are, are thinking about their properties, right? You can see the property behind me. Imagine the owner. This, by the way, used to be a hotel, Tina's Dockside Inn. You can see what's left. It's, it's rubble. It's debris. Look at these stairs that would lead into one of the cottages that is no longer here. So imagine for residents to return to this, uh, what they're thinking about right now is cleaning up what they can, saving any items uh, that they can. So that's what's been on their mind as we've had these conversations, right? They, they want to clean up everything as best as possible. Uh, they've been told to move any debris they can to the side of the property. That's all going to get picked up. Uh, but they also began thinking now about what is the next step, dealing with the insurance, figuring out what type of help is out there. I spoke with Tina that owns uh, this uh, property, and we talked about uh, what kind of help is available, if she knew about the help, and here's part of the conversation that we had. You lost your home, you lost your hotel, and... It is what it is. I didn't, we didn't lose anybody, you know? That's, that's what it's all about, I guess. So her mind was thinking about other things. It was very difficult for her to start thinking about how much it's going to cost to fix this place, what the next step is. So a lot of the homeowners are, are sort of figuring out what the next step is. Now, they have set up some, um, uh, like there's some tables on the entrance of uh, town here with information for a lot of the residents as to what kind of help exists out there. So, for example, there are some bridge loans, emergency loans that people can apply for, and these they can get really fast. It doesn't have interest until the other help comes in, which takes time. For those that have insurance, it's money they'll get from insurance or the help that can come in from FEMA. But what I've uh, heard from a lot of the residents uh, today as we spoke was that they really don't know what help is out there, and they want to get more information as to what kind of help will come uh, from FEMA, Aaron. Yeah, that information really is power, and it's a question a lot of people are asking about what help is going to come from FEMA. We know that President Biden is going to go to Florida tomorrow. Do we know what the administration is saying about this money, about those concerns, about this money that's about to run out? Right. So the president said he's asked Congress for more money. We know that they had already requested about $12 billion for that fund that FEMA uses because of all the natural disasters that we dealt with this year. Now they're asking for an additional $4 billion. So essentially, uh, the president is saying now Congress has to approve more money so that FEMA can distribute that money because we have this natural disaster here in Florida, but we also had the fires in Hawaii. We have fires in Louisiana and other natural disasters that, of course, when an emergency is declared, when a federal emergency is declared, then money goes to these areas. So now we have what's happened here in Florida. And you see the numbers out there. So there's an estimate that it's going to be billions of dollars in insurance claims alone. Plus, other than the properties, you have damage to the infrastructure, the power lines, roads, and other things that are also going to cost money, Aaron. All right. Guad Venegas for us on the Florida, west coast of Florida today. Guad, thank you. Ohio police today releasing new body cam video of the moment officers shot and killed a pregnant black woman in her car. 
Her family calling that incident a, quote, gross misuse of power and authority. Officers approached 21-year-old Takia Young outside a grocery store for allegedly stealing. They told her to get out of the car multiple times, but eventually Young starts moving her car toward an officer standing in front of it. Now, we are going to show you the video of that moment here in just a second. We do want to warn you that it may be difficult to watch. Out of the car. Now, moments later, the officer shoots at Young, and seconds later, her car hits the grocery store's wall. Officers then broke Young's car window to get her out and to give her medical aid, police said. Now, Young's family wants the officer involved here to be charged for Young and her unborn daughter's deaths. Mara Barrett is joining me now. Uh, Mara, this body camera footage is out there now. The police department, I know, also released its use of force policy at the same time. So what is the police department saying about this video now and, and about the potential action that could be held, take, taken against the officer who fired the shot? Well, as of right now, Aaron, we do know that the officer that fired the shot is on administrative leave as the investigation continues. Now, the police department, though, has been pretty intentional, a little tight-lipped about what they can say, and they acknowledge this in the release of the video with a statement today calling the incident a tragedy uh, as they acknowledge that Miss Young's family is understandably very upset and grieving. They noted that a lawsuit is very likely to be filed about this incident and that there might be other legal proceedings, and that's why they're limited in what they can say, but I do want to call attention to this use of force policy, because this is kind of important when after we're, we've been able to look at the details of the video. Basically, their use of force policy says an officer should only discharge a firearm at a moving vehicle or its occupants when the officer reasonably believes that there are no other reasonable means available to avert the imminent threat of the vehicle or if deadly force other than the vehicle is directed at the officer. And so law enforcement analysts have explained that deadly force can be seen as another firearm, a knife, or a vehicle that could place the officer in danger. However, what we've seen a lot of criticism pop up today as this video has been released, and as you just watched in that video, the officer placed himself in front of that vehicle intentionally um, on his own. And this is something that law enforcement experts have pointed out is, is something that they are actually trained repeatedly against, as this is such a dangerous position to be in. So I think that's something we'll be watching for as this investigation continues. Yeah, for sure. We'll be looking for more details on that. I do want to ask you about uh, this young woman's family. I know they watched the body camera video before it was released to the public. W what are they saying tonight? Where do things go from here for them? The family is calling this an abuse of power, uh, and they said that their, that Takaya Young's death uh, was unavoidable. They also pointed out that uh, the, she's leaving behind two sons, as it is, uh, and her unborn baby girl was due in November, did not make it as well. They said this incident is yet another pow painful reminder of the urgent need for a thorough reexamination of police training, policies, and procedures. The responsibility of law enforcement is to serve and protect all in our communities, not just those who they deem worthy of protection. Uh, now, they did call for a, a swift indictment of the officer, but the investigation has been handed over for now to the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation, Aaron. All right, we'll be watching this. More Barrett for us in our Chicago Bureau. Thank you. Tonight, a convicted murderer is on the loose after escaping from a Pennsylvania prison, and police say he is extremely dangerous. A manhunt now underway for, for this man you see on your screen here, Danilo Cavalcante, uh, Cavalcante. Now, he, is, he escaped from prison just days after being given a life sentence for killing his ex-girlfriend. He's also wanted in connection with a 2017 murder in Brazil, where he originally is from. Here's the Chester County, Pennsylvania DA earlier today. We believe that he is still in the general area. There is no evidence at this time to suggest that anyone has helped facilitate this escape or is assisting him at this time. We believe that he is hiding somewhere locally and that he is alone. A $10,000 reward is being offered for any information that leads to his capture. Stephen Romo is tracking this story for us today. Stephen, we know that this has been a full court press, local, state, federal authorities all out looking for this guy now. The DA's office says that they're using every tool available to find Cavalcante. What exactly does that mean? Lay out this search for us. Yeah, hey, Aaron, they're really just hitting 
how dangerous they believe Cavalcante actually is. They're using drones, they're using helicopters, they're using dogs now to go out and try to find him. As we heard in that soundbite from the DA there in Chester County, they believe he's somewhere in that area hiding potentially in a property around that area. They're asking homeowners nearby to keep a lookout if they see anything, a missing bicycle, missing clothes, anything like that, to contact authorities immediately. That is their biggest fear right now. They do say they believe he is alone right now, and they think that he's heading south, trying to get to Mexico. We see uh, these latest photos we have of him. He was seen walking about a mile away from that jail about an hour after he disappeared. He was last seen around 8.50 a.m. on Thursday. He's uh, five foot tall, around 120 pounds, but they say not to let his smaller stature make you think that he's not dangerous. He's accused and he's actually been convicted just last week of the brutal killing of his girlfriend back in 2021, a stabbing death in front of her two children, ages four and seven years old. And they say that happened because his girlfriend found out he was wanted for murder in Brazil. They say he is very dangerous, Aaron. So, Stephen, at this point, what do we know about how he has escaped, if anything? What's the prison saying? Yeah, we've actually been trying to get more information about that. We asked yesterday and today, and so far, they're not saying how he escaped. It's a question many people have because there are other inmates in that facility. Right now, they really are just focusing on the danger that he poses at present, trying to get this photo out to people, saying to look, uh, uh, if you see him in the area, if you do spot him, instead of approaching him, just call 911, not to even risk it, Aaron. All right, Stephen Roma for us tonight. Stephen, thank you. Let's turn to Hawaii now. We are just learning about brand new warning sirens Maui will use to alert people about wildfires and to make sure they know to evacuate in extreme threats. This after sirens were not used during the deadly wildfires that swept through historic Lahaina in August. And this comes as we're seeing a lot of criticism and questions about how officials there could have prepared more or responded better to the fires that killed at least 115 people. And we should also hear from Hawaii's governor, really any minute now we understand, who's expected to announce the number of missing people will now drop to under 50. I want to bring in Sam Brock, who's on Maui for us again tonight. Sam, uh, new sirens here. Bring us up to speed on this. What more are we learning about these new emergency protocols? Sure, they're going to change. There's no question about that, Aaron. You know, one of the facts, at least, that we do have drilled down from that fateful day on August 8th is that the emergency sirens were not activated intentionally because the emergency management director at the time made the calculation, he said, that it could have forced people or pushed them to the flames once they heard the sirens go off. Now, since the county has pivoted, we also know, by the way, that only a matter of days ago, this past Saturday, there was a brush fire. The sirens were activated. Text messages were sent out to the people in those neighborhoods to make sure that they were aware where and evacuations were carried out. All of that did happen. So clearly, it's possible that the mechanisms are in place to do it. Uh, Daryl Oliveira, who is the now acting director of their emergency management agency, sat down with KHNL, our affiliate here, in his first one-on-one -on -one interview and said that he promises that those sirens will be incorporated into any sort of emergency protocol moving forward. So they have addressed that. But there's still so much criticism, as you mentioned, for where law enforcement and first responders were that night and at what time. And so in this Facebook message that was posted yesterday, Mayor Bisson, who's been at the top of that criticism, partly because of the fact he said he didn't know who was in charge when he was asked earlier this week, came out and said that he was at the emergency operations center, that he had folks there since 630 in the morning all the way through the next day, but they didn't even learn about fatalities until August 9th. And he also was getting emotional just talking about how it's impacted this community. Here's what he said. We all champion our community's interests. Our historical significance and our cultural heritage. We will be tested as others try to divide us and even turn us against each other. Aaron, as for the FBI's list of those still unaccounted for, which was over a thousand only about a week and a half ago, we're told that there should be an update, should be this afternoon, but we have not received one so far. We've heard, though, from the governor, it could drop below 50. You know, Sam, we know that the trauma there uh, is deeply felt. I know there was a statewide vigil, there's going to be a statewide vigil today for people who were killed in the fires. Can you give us a sense of how people are doing right now, how they're recovering, uh, what uh, a number dropping to under 50 might mean for folks there in Maui? 
Sure, it would be significant. It's a day of prayer right now, and that's actually all the Hawaiian islands, Aaron. You know, we saw these beautiful images from this morning of crowds gathered on the, on the beach and performing prayers and, and reading and really just con connecting together. That was really part of the messaging here. But as far as the figure is concerned, there's a lot of doubt in the community that that could be accurate. How do you go from a number in the thousands down to 50? I just spoke with one woman whose uncle died, and she said, look, does that include the Jane and John Doe's, all the people where we have some information, but not all information, and they have partial human remains, but not all human remains. A lot of folks have not submitted their DNA samples to even match those. How can you tell us at this point in time that we went from a massive number down to a number below 50. So there, there is doubt right now as to the accuracy of that, but this community is looking for any piece of good news that they can get their hands on. All right, Sam Brock for us on Maui tonight. Thank you, Sam. Coming up, she wrote a book about dealing with grief. Now she's in court accused of killing her husband. The details we're learning from prosecutors today. Plus, the new one-on-one, -on -one, rather one-stop shop for UFO information and what the Pentagon has to do with that. We'll explain that for you later in The Five Things. Today, the defense in the case of a Utah author accused of poisoning her husband says they need more time to prepare their case before heading into a preliminary hearing. You see Corey Richens here today in court in that blue shirt as her lawyers, prosecutors, and the judge tried to hash out a date to check back in for a status hearing set for early November. Richens is accused of killing her husband, Eric, last March by lacing his drink with a fentanyl dose that could actually could have killed five people. She was arrested back in May while she had been promoting her new children's book on coping with grief. Richens hasn't entered a plea just yet. Civil rights attorney and former prosecutor Kristen Gibbons Fedden joins me now. Uh, so, Kristen, the defense said that there's a ton of evidence that they need to sift through from the state in this case. The Richens lawyer is suggesting that they would be ready for a preliminary hearing, hearing uh, early next year. Uh, does that make sense to you? Is that typical for a case like this, that the defense would, would want to push off the preliminary hearing that far? Well, it's interesting because they may want to utilize that opportunity to potentially get some of the charges knocked down or even see if they could get a waiver, which means they wouldn't go through with the hearing, but have some of the charges kicked out. But listen, it's not unusual. This is a very high profile case. It is a very serious case. It deals with forensic accounting, forensic evidence, uh, forensic toxicology testing. So from all of those standpoints, it does take a lot of extra time and preparation to get this case ready. Is it abnormal for us, for a defense to request that much time for a preliminary hearing? Yeah, because you don't need to pull down a full case. You don't need to have all of your defenses. At the preliminary hearing, the evidentiary standard for a prosecutor is much lower. So there's a lot less to defend. Um, but again, the defense may be utilizing this opportunity to really seek a strategic advantage, and that's probably to get some of the charges knocked off. All right, we appreciate you helping us understand what's happening here. It's, uh, as you said, a high-profile case. A lot of people are paying attention to it. Kristen Gibbons-Fedden, thank you. To, to New Hampshire now, where 15-year-old Quinn Mitchell, an aspiring journalist, has made it his mission to ask presidential candidates tough questions. In a viral moment from earlier this summer, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Florida governor and presidential hopeful Ron DeSantis, asking him a question about January 6th, and that made headlines. A week later, when DeSantis was set to attend a 4th of July parade in Merrimack, Qu Quinn was there as well and hoped to follow up with the governor and apologize for any trouble that he caused. But, as you can see in this video taken by NBC News, a man wearing a branded DeSantis 2024 hat stepped between Florida's first family and Quinn. Quinn also claims that someone grabbed him by the back of his shirt. Now, DeSantis keeps marching here with the parade and turns around to say, you live in New Hampshire? Come to my next event. Now, Quinn attended DeSantis's town hall after that on August 19th. He tried to say hello to the governor after the event, but says he was blocked by security. Now, the DeSantis campaign and Super PAC have not responded to NBC News' request for comment, but, you know, the occasional tough moment on the campaign trail hasn't really dampened Quinn's enthusiasm for covering politics. NBC News 2024 campaign embed Emma Barnett has the story. What would you do to make sure that Russia does not interfere in our elections? Do you believe that Trump violated the peaceful transfer of power? DeSantis a few days ago or yesterday said that January 6th was not an insurrection. Do you tell me some of your thoughts, folks? 
You might think the person asking these questions is a veteran reporter, but it's actually 15-year-old Quinn Mitchell. He lives in New Hampshire and has become somewhat of a staple over the past two presidential election cycles, attending over 85 different events and meeting more than 35 presidential candidates. When I learned this history was being made in my backyard, I knew I wanted to play a part in it and ask these questions. Quinn is not even old enough to vote yet, but he plays a big part in the democratic process. And I think New Hampshire is very unique in how we value retail politics. Meeting the candidates face to face gives them the chance to ask questions, tough questions. He asks real questions and he not only asks them of me, he asks them of everybody else. And that's what this process is all about. Quinn's even been mentioned in stump speeches. He's like 11 years old. Some of the candidates he's met over the years are convinced he's going to be a politician. Oh, yeah, I'd love it. Oh. When you're president, you say Joe Biden's outside, don't say Joe who, okay? And seeing Governor or Senator Quinn, and I will be completely unsurprised. But Quinn's not aiming for a governor's mansion or the halls of Congress. He wants to be a journalist. His research process is thorough. Me on my computer for hours, <laughs> just like researching candidates on C-SPAN or watching their interviews. And he's learned challenging candidates is not always well received. The kids being used as pathetic political props, no. I can't. That accusation from Fox News after he asked Joe Biden a question about Trump's impeachment proceedings. Unless we're changing the voting age to 11, why is he making a pitch to little children? Wait, kids say the darndest things. Yeah, yeah that they're the coached to say. Thing. The irony, according to Quinn, is the adults around him often suggest asking softer questions. He says his dad floated asking Biden about his dogs. I thought of the question by myself. No help from him. Apparently he was the person who told me to ask that question, but no, 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 he, he told me to ask about dogs' names, um, something I could easily could just could have uh, Googled. Instead, Quinn is old school. He reads books written by the candidates. Many of them are now signed. Does reading these books help you think of questions before going to all of the town halls? Oh, absolutely. It gives me a lot of great ideas, and it also helps me you know, understand their character or, and their past offices, what policies they set forth and what they stand for. He also collects posters, yard signs, and signatures. Abedo, Elizabeth Warren. In 2019, he got most of the presidential candidates to sign this T-shirt. And back in April, he got Trump to sign a MAGA hat. Quinn is hoping to cross his 100th campaign event before the New Hampshire primaries. What are you going to do to celebrate the 100th? <laughs> Probably cake. Yeah. <laughs> you must be so excited to turn 18. I, I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to voting for the first time. I think it's 2026. Emma Barnett, Walpole, New Hampshire, NBC News. Now, Quinn is also going multi-platform, apparently. He just started a podcast to cover the New Hampshire primaries. And our thanks to our campaign embed, Emma Barnett, for that report. Let's get to the five things now that our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, just in the last hour or so, former Proud Boys leader Ethan Nordeen was sentenced to 18 years in prison for his role in the Capitol riot. And that ties the record for longest sentence in the January 6th attack. And earlier today, Dominic Pozzola, a proud boy who smashed a Capitol window with a stolen police riot shield, was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He yelled, Trump won, as he walked out of the courtroom. Former top Proud Boys leader, Enrique Terrio, is set to be sentenced on Tuesday. Number two, Egyptian billionaire Mohammed Al-Fayed has died at 94 years old. Al-Fayed was famous for his love of British culture, owning the London-based Fulham Football Club and Harrods Department Store. His son, Dodi Fayed, was in the car that killed Prince, uh, when Princess Diana was killed in Paris. Al-Fayed, who was accused of sexual harassment numerous times, spent years spreading conspiracy theories that Prince Philip ordered the fatal accident in Paris. Number three, today the Biden administration put out a plan that would regulate staffing at nursing homes for the first time. Now, the rules would require staff to spend a certain amount of time with their patients. And the government said most nursing homes would need to add staff. Number four, this is the Pentagon's new website that is meant to be a one-stop shop for UFOs. Or for information about them, I guess. The Pentagon said it's going to share declassified information, including photos and videos. It'll have information on resolved cases, too, and a tool for government employees to make reports. Number five, if you're trying to, if you were trying to find the Florida-Utah college football game last night on ESPN, or maybe the U.S. Open, 
You might have had some trouble, and that's because Disney and Charter Communications are in a big fight over contract fees. So Disney networks like ESPN, ABC, FX, they all went dark. Charter's Spectrum Cable Service has millions of customers all over the country, including people in big cities like New York, LA, Dallas, Atlanta. Charter executives today called the pay TV ecosystem broken. Disney said it's committed to finding a resolution with Charter. Coming up, we are giving today's new jobs numbers a fresh look, why they could have a big impact on what's in your wallet. And the new eyes in the sky, the surveillance method the NYPD could use to peek into your backyard this holiday weekend. It's a crackdown on large gatherings. That's ahead in the local. A brand new jobs report just into us today showing a still resilient labor market. The U.S. adding more jobs than expected in August. And it's got the White House celebrating a bit, the president claiming we are in one of the strongest job growth periods ever. Listen. Some experts said to get inflation under control, we needed higher unemployment and lower wages. But I've never thought that was the problem. Too many people are having a job or that working people were making too much money. But it's not all good news. Take a look at this. The unemployment rate is now at 3.8 percent, up from the last report and the highest since February of last year. Brian Chung is at the big board to break it all down for us, help us understand what's happening here. Brian, what does this jobs report really signal about the state of our economy? Hey, Aaron, and there is a little bit of nuance to the unemployment rate that I want to point out, but let's rehash the numbers as you mentioned them. So 187,000 jobs, that's how many were added in the month of August. That was above Wall Street estimates of 170,000 and also above the 157,000 pace that we saw in the month of July. Now, when we talk about what industries saw the gains, we're looking at leisure and hospitality, think bars and restaurants adding 40,000 jobs in the month. Also take a look at the mall adding over 6,000 jobs in retail and healthcare. This is gangbusters almost 71,000 jobs added in the month this offsets some losses that we saw in the motion picture industry because of the Hollywood strike in addition to the trucking industry because of the bankruptcy of yellow now what caught a lot of attention in this report was as you mentioned that three point uh, rather th sorry 3.8 percent unemployment rate which was a tick up from the 3.5 percent that we saw in July but that was mostly because there were people entering the labor force which economists say is a good thing Aaron and so, Brian, we know that the Fed's going to meet in a couple of weeks here now. How does this report help us anticipate what the Fed might do next? Yeah, well, I'll show you the number that they're looking at. They are looking at this right here, average hourly earnings growth. How much more are people getting paid in August of this year compared to August of last year? And that figure came in at 4.3 percent. And that's a little bit slower than the 4.4 percent we saw in the July to July period, which for Americans, they might be saying, well, I don't know if I like that wage growth is slowing. But what the Federal Reserve would would like to see is this number not going to zero, but also not going up to 10 percent either, because maybe employers then pass that on in the form of higher inflation. So the Fed looking at this number and saying, hey, that could be Goldilocks right there, Ann. All right. Brian Chung for us tonight. Brian, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, nearly 44 million Americans will start to see interest pile up again on their student loans. That's with the start of repayments just a month away. And that's because the Supreme Court blocked the Biden administration's plan to cancel nearly $1.8 trillion in federal debt. Now, you can see how that interest is driving up the burden for Americans. Just 15 years ago, the debt load was something like $600 billion. Now it is three times that, not keeping pace with the number of borrowers. So now the White House is working on new ways to come up with forgiveness, including targeting smaller groups and trying to lessen the burden on others. Shaquille Brewster is on this story for us tonight. So, Shaq, uh, walk us through some of these other plans that the Biden administration is working through now. How are they going to help people? Yeah, Aaron, there's definitely a lot out there. You mentioned it. For millions of borrowers, those payments are going to be due in the next couple of weeks. But there are several hundred thousand people who are now seeing a new balance in their account of zero dollars and zero cents. How is that? Well, the administration launched back in April of 2022 a one-time adjustment for certain loans and certain programs that already cancel loans after 20 to 25 years of payments. 
payments. You see that debt for some people going down to zero. Borrowers were essentially credited for late or partial payments and for the time that their loans were in forbearance. So it was a one-time fix, a recalculation, so to speak, for these loans. That cleared about nearly 40 billion dollars of debt. I want you to listen to one person who talked to me about this. Other people said it was life-changing. Some people said it was a burden off their shoulder. Listen to what Sarah Walsh in the Chicago area told me. I'm not so pressured to pay my bills that I have. I can start budgeting a way to get a car um, since I've never owned a car in my entire life. Now, opponents of this have already begun to file lawsuits. There's challenges working their way up through the federal court. One thing that they say is that this likely won't impact debt that has already been forgiven, but could impact future rounds of forgiveness, Aaron. And so what about the other people? I mean, there are millions of other borrowers out there, right? What do experts recommend yeah. some of those people do, pay off their loans if they can, or, or just sort of hope that the Biden administration is going to come up with something for them? There are other programs that the administration is touting right now. If you go to studentaid.gov slash save, you learn about this new program that they just launched last month. Essentially, what it does is it cuts the minimum payment for folks uh, who are on income payment, uh, income driven repayment plans. So instead of 10 percent of your discretionary income, you pay 5 percent. You see that monthly payment will go to zero dollars a month for some people. And there's even opportunities for early forgiveness. Again, there are Lots of programs out there. Take a look at studentaid.gov slash save and see if one of those programs could work for you. All right, Shaquille Brewster for us tonight. Shaq, thank you. Well, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have done it for you. We call this segment The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, Colorado officials saying eight people were hurt in a possible road rage shooting on Thursday. A local sheriff's office said the suspect or suspects shot at another vehicle on a highway, which made the car crash and catch fire. An ambulance responding to the incident also caught fire. Nobody was seriously hurt, though. Also from our Western Bureau, the CEO of Salesforce telling the San Francisco Chronicle that if homelessness or drug use impacts its Dreamforce conference later this month, it could be the last time the company holds its big conference in that city. Something like 40,000 people are expected to go, and the Chronicle reports that there haven't been any major reported incidents involving the unhoused or drug use at the Dreamforce event in recent years. Out of our Northeastern Bureau, police in New York City are going to be keeping an eye on big parties this weekend from the sky. The NYPD says it plans to send drones out in response to complaints about large gatherings, including private ones, basically so they can figure out whether police need to go there or not. The announcement got immediate backlash from privacy and civil liberties advocates who questioned whether using drones like this violates any laws. We'll see. Coming up. How the popularity of new weight loss drugs like Wegovy and Ozempic are changing the economy of an entire country. Plus, we're gonna, we talk a lot about Texas's fragile power system, but a big reason there haven't been any large outages this summer may just shock you. That's ahead. Stick around. Now we want to bring you today's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. It has been a summer of record-breaking temperatures and constant heat waves. And in Texas, that state has seen some of the worst of it, ending just the, uh, just ending the hottest August in that state's history. And with the record heat came record demand for power, as you might imagine. But the state didn't have any widespread power outages. One of the reasons for that may actually surprise you. NBC's Priscilla Thompson reports. In Kaufman, Texas, next to one of the oldest crops in our nation, a new harvest is on the horizon. Texas is the biggest oil producing state in the country, but you might be surprised to hear it's now also a big leader in renewable energy. When people ask me what I do, I love to tell them that I'm a farmer. And then, you know, a lot of times that prompts the question, well, what do you farm? And I say, the sun. David Fulkerson manages this nearly 1,200-acre Anel Green Power solar farm near Dallas. How many homes can this operation power? So we can produce up to 180 megawatts, which is about 36,000 homes. The Lone Star State is now the leading producer of wind energy in the U.S. and second only to California in solar energy. 
Over the past decade, wind energy production here has increased by more than 234 percent, solar by nearly 14,000 percent, and it's expected to double again in the next two years. So what's fueling the growth here in Texas? So many people are moving to Texas, which gives easy expansion for solar and wind. Texas runs its own power grid with lots of flat, windy, sunny land and federal tax incentives, experts say, making it ripe for a renewable energy boom. How important is renewable energy in Texas? And that grid diversity is what prevents outages and loss of power for people's homes. Crucial during this summer of unrelenting heat, which fueled historic demand on the Texas power grid, setting 10 all-time high records since the final days of June. Despite the unprecedented demand, Texas hasn't experienced widespread outages, which hasn't always been the case. Millions of Texans are in their homes without power, and it is very cold there. So what's changed? Since the winter freeze in 2021, the power grid has been winterized, and more wind and solar farms have opened shop. The solar panels help capture the power, but it's really the battery storage system that can be one of the last lines of defense against a possible power grid failure. Texas is in much better position now than it was a couple years ago, but we always have risk. Dr. Michael Weber is a professor of energy resources and studies clean energy policy at UT Austin. He says that the incredible growth in renewables in Texas comes despite some serious political headwinds. I've always been very pro oil and gas. Texas is going to protect the oil and gas industry. While most states and regions and countries are trying to move away from fossil fuels, Texas is actively subsidizing natural gas. Even so, about 35% of the state's electricity now comes from wind and solar. Is the idea that one day 100% of our energy would come from wind and solar alone? Not necessarily. What can happen is solar and wind can still grow, but ultimately you want a diverse grid system where you have wind, solar, battery storage, and other traditional methods. Ushering in the dawn of a new day across Texas's energy landscape. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News, Kaufman, Texas. And Priscilla actually joins us live now. Uh, Priscilla, listening to the piece there, you mentioned the political headwinds for, for wind and solar for that industry uh, there in Texas, but you also talked about the storage issue there. There are some potential challenges with storing the power that's generated, right? Right, Aaron, and that's something that our expert mentioned. He said it would be incredibly difficult to run a grid 100% on wind and solar power because of the amount of battery storage that would be possible and the enormous amount of space that would be needed in order to store those batteries, as you saw in the piece. Now, Anel tells us that they have added five battery storage facilities this summer. They're planning to add another six within the year and say that they'll continue to build that out. But of course, the question is, what happens when you run out of space. Aaron? Yeah, it is a big question, but this is the wave of the future, and so they'll have to figure it out uh, in order to, to keep moving forward. Priscilla Thompson for us in Texas tonight. Thank yeah. you, Priscilla. Well, a company most people had never heard of a few years ago, Novo Nordisk, is now the most valuable public company in Europe. Why? Well, the Danish company makes Ozempic and Wagovi, the two highly popular weight loss drugs that are helping in the fight against diabetes, obesity, heart attacks, strokes now. Economists telling the New York Times that Novo Nordisk is responsible for just about all of Denmark's economic growth and may even be helping keep interest rates down there. Matt Bradley joins us now. Uh, he's in, in, in London for us today. So, Matt, Novo Nordisk riding a wave, really, of demand for these highly effective drugs for diabetes and for weight loss. That sent earnings and shares to record highs there. Uh, help us understand exactly what's playing out here for, for the company and for Denmark and, and how this is sort of dictating what happens when you look at the numbers or how you look at the numbers there for the economy in that country. Well, yeah, it's a question of how you look at the numbers. You mentioned that it was actually, and this is just breaking news just today, that Novo Nordisk surpassed France's LVMH, and you know them because of Louis Vuitton and, and uh, Dior, as the largest, the largest company in terms of market capitalization. Now, another interesting statistic here, Aaron, uh, you know, Novo Nordisk is actually larger in market capitalization than Denmark's economy is in gross national product. So those are two different, different indicators, of course, but it really just goes 
goes to show that Novo Nordisk has taken over, in certain ways, the, Den the Danish economy. It hasn't, it hasn't really taken over the Danish economy, but it has been responsible solely for mm. all of the growth in really the last couple of years. We just saw that growth in uh, the Danish economy has reached nearly 2 percent over the last year. Novo Nordisk and the pharmaceutical industry around that, which is much smaller than this company, is it accounts for about 1.7 percent of that nearly 2 percent. So as you can see, without the pharmaceutical industry in Denmark, there would be no growth. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of mind blowing to think about one industry or one company being tied to all of that growth for an entire country. Are there uh, any drawbacks of having a country's economic growth so tied to one industry like this? Yeah, it's a really good question, Aaron. I mean, when you look at places like in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia or some of these other Gulf countries, you know, their rentier economies, they're based entirely on oil, and they've been doing very well, making their populations extremely wealthy for generations. But that's not really the same for Novo Nordisk and for these drugs, because at some point, as with all drugs, they're going to go generic. Anybody's going to be able to make these drugs, and then anybody's going to be able to profit off of them. And that's a big risk, and that means that the economy is going to be suffering. You can look at neighboring Finland, where there was Nokia. Remember, we all used to have Nokia cell phones, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, we didn't. We got iPhones. Well, the economy of Finland single-handedly was buoyed by those Nokia phones that were purchased all throughout the world. And then suddenly, when people stopped buying Nokia phones, the economy, the entire economy of that entire country sank along with Nokia. And that's something, uh, that's a real issue that a lot of people don't want to see happening in Denmark. Yeah, something to watch closely here for Denmark uh, going into the future. Matt Bradley for us tonight. Matt, appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, the shifting nature of college sports and why one of the biggest and most powerful leagues on the East Coast is adding teams from all the way across the country. Stick around, that's next. Well, one of the biggest and most powerful college sports leagues, the Atlantic Coast Conference, today adding teams from, well, the Pacific Coast. Today, the ACC formally admitting Stanford, the University of California, Berkeley, and Southern Methodist University in Dallas to its roster. That's going to be starting next year. You see the map here highlighting just how far away these newcomers are to the rest of the conference, all of which are in the Eastern Time Zone. But in a statement, the chair of the ACC's board of directors saying the move will strengthen this league now and in the future. The move is also effectively the final nail in the coffin for the Pac-12 conference, the country's oldest, because as you see here, 10 of its 12 members have abandoned ship over the last year. Why? Because of how money and TV deals are rapidly changing the college sports landscape. Noah Pransky is all over this for us tonight. So, uh, Noah, for folks who need to learn a little bit more, give us a better understanding about why college sports are, are shifting so much right now. Yeah, you probably won't even recognize the conferences that you grew up watching, but it's all about chasing the football dollar. Um, Realignment's been happening for a few decades, but right now, really just unprecedented amount of it because there's consolidation, and consolidation has meant leverage when it comes to negotiating TV deals. And you have a lot of conferences consolidating down right now into four big conferences, pretty much, although it may continue to shrink from there. But right now, we're looking at four major football conferences, and I want to show you a different kind of map here that can show you exactly how this is playing out. We're going to visualize the states that are represented by the four big football conferences here. The Atlantic Coast Conference, as you mentioned, Aaron, now including West Coast teams, of course. The Southeastern Conference, SEC, now up to 16 teams, including teams like Missouri, which are neither South nor Eastern. The Big 12, no longer 12 teams. They're going to 16 with the addition of Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, and Colorado. And then the Big 10, which hasn't actually been 10 teams since 1990, is going to 18 teams soon. And frankly, they're unlikely to stop there. It's tough, Aaron, on those of us who are fans, but it's also tough on the student athletes who are going to have to do a lot more travel moving forward. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but, you know, there's another way to think about this. You mentioned the fact that a lot of this seems to be about football, right, and football dollars. But there are a lot of other sports, a lot of other athletes who are not going to be big profiters off of their name, image, and likeness using the rules in the same way as some of the football players, athletes who, who don't just play on Saturdays for big TV audiences. What about them? They're going to be impacted here. 
So there's like two big concerns, right? We talk about revenue sports, which are football and men's basketball typically, and then non-revenue sports or your Olympic sports. And there's concern that as we put more attention on football and athletes getting paid is a good thing in a lot of ways, but also that's taking some money out of the other operations of the sport. The more athletes get paid, maybe the less that goes to the school. And that means there is less to fund a lot of these non-revenue Olympic sports. So a lot of the athletes in sports like swimming, track and field, basically, all the sports that we use college NCAA system to fund our Olympic teams to train them, there's concern that that money might not be there moving forward. All right, Noah Pransky, thank you. That is a wrap for this hour. Coverage picks up right now. And as we come on the air this hour, a ton of people are hitting the roads and taking to the skies. And airlines already under fire for delays, cancellations, and close calls are feeling the pressure. With a new scare just today and the leftover effects of Hurricane Idalia, can they keep up? Then, the Utah mom accused of killing her husband with a fentanyl overdose and then writing a children's book about grief back in court today, why her defense team says they need more time. In Pennsylvania, a manhunt is underway for an extremely dangerous convicted murderer who escaped prison. We'll have the latest on the search there. And the student loan payment pause is over. If you're worried about squeezing those extra payments back into your budget, we have what you need to know. Plus, the 15-year-old who is putting candidates like Ron DeSantis on the spot. We're going to introduce you to Quinn Mitchell, who's known for asking the tough questions on the campaign trail. Hey, everybody, I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Halley. And with the last long weekend of the summer upon us now, one in three Americans getting ready to squeeze in one last vacation, something like 95 million of us plan to travel. So take a look at traffic starting to really get going on highways really all over the country, just piling up there. Or look at this, packed airports. This crowd at Chicago O'Hare's International Airport. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg was there in the last couple of hours. Listen. This weekend is capping what TSA reports is the busiest summer travel period on record. The most air travel passengers that have been screened by TSA in American history. Emily Iketa is at Newark Liberty International Airport in New Jersey for us tonight. So, Emily, set the scene for us. We're rolling into Labor Day weekend. What's it looking like? Hey there, Aaron. Well, we're seeing an 11% increase in air travel, at least compared to this time last year, over the very busy Labor Day weekend. And you can see those bustling passengers behind me continue to fill airports like this here at Newark. One of the busiest days we'll see play out over the next couple of days. Some 14 million passengers will be taking to the skies through Wednesday. And this is coming and capping off what we've seen, a summer season of record travel as we continue to see this rebound travel, this revenge travel, if you will, since the pandemic. People so eager, itching to get out and explore. Across the board, we're seeing an increase. Take a look at some of these numbers from cruises to, bo uh, to hotel bookings to uh, flights to rental cars. We're seeing a 4% increase domestically and an even higher increase for international. Some of the most inter, uh, popular international destinations, where are people going? Well, according to AAA, that includes Vancouver, Rome, London, Dublin, Paris. Hey, Erin, I'd consider going to any of those locations. Now, we know the majority of Americans, they take to the roadway. So if you haven't left at this point, try to wait until later into the evening to see some, um, some better traffic, some faster moving traffic. And of course, Sunday, unsurprisingly, is one of the best days to drive, Aaron. Yeah, I want to ask you too, Emily, about uh, a close call that we learned about today. This was at an airport here in the D.C. area today. I know that Secretary Buttigieg was asked about these close calls today too. Uh, what did he have to say about it? Well, Erin, it happened at Reagan National Airport earlier today in an extremely busy airport with an extremely busy runway. And essentially what we're learning from the FAA, what happened is that an air traffic controller called off a Delta plane from landing because there was still another aircraft on that same runway trying to take off. Now, just a perspective check here. This wasn't an incident where these air... Uh, these airplanes almost clipped each other, but it's still an, uh, an incident that's under investigation by the FAA. Just hours be before, we actually heard Secretary Buttigieg get a question asked about the increase, the surge in these close call situations we've been seeing play out over the course of the summer. Here's more of what he had to say. We 
we've seen a noticeable increase in serious close calls. And the only acceptable number of these is zero. The truth is there is no single cause or single issue that explains it. Sometimes we have seen issues with pilots. Sometimes we have seen issues with controllers. Uh, sometimes we've seen an issue with ground crews. So, Aaron, let's end on a positive note. We know from the FAA that there are roughly 50,000 flights scheduled for today alone. But you take a look at FlightAware, and there are only 100 flight cancellations so far today, Aaron. I like that perspective. We'll end on a somewhat positive note there. Emily Iketa for us uh, at Newark Liberty tonight. Emily, thanks. We do have some breaking news we want to tell you about now. We're learning that Rudy Giuliani is pleading not guilty to charges that he conspired to overturn former President Trump's 2020 election loss in Georgia. Now, Trump's former personal attorney is waiving his appearance at a Fulton County courthouse. That would have been next Wednesday. The former president also waiving that appearance, as are 10 other co-defendants. We've been learning about this throughout the week. No trial date has been set as of yet. And some more breaking news coming in just now. We're learning uh, this out of Florida in the last hour or so. Governor Ron DeSantis just said that he will not meet with President Biden, who is going to tour damage from Hurricane Idalia tomorrow, just hours after President Biden said the two men would meet. As officials there are now rushing to clean up the damage and to restore power for nearly 100,000 customers, that's after this hurricane pummeled the state's northwest coast, the strongest hurricane to hit that area in more than 100 years. And people there who are starting to assess the damage face new questions about whether they will get the federal aid they need or even if FEMA has enough money to actually help. And that's because FEMA is putting out a new warning that the country's disaster relief fund will run out in just the next two weeks. Let's bring in Guad Venegas now in Horseshoe Beach, Florida, there on the Big Bend, uh, where the storm made landfall. Guad, uh, you've been talking to folks there for a couple of days now. What are people telling you on the ground today? How concerned are they about actually getting the help that they need? Aaron, a lot of the people that I spoke to today are focused on this, what they have in front of them right now, which is rubble, which is destruction, what's left of their homes. You can see this. This is just one of the piles of debris left here in Horseshoe Beach. This is part of a home, air conditioning units. Uh, you've got wooden beams and everything that was left behind. What they've been working on is on pushing a lot of this uh, debris over to the side, uh, waiting for this to be collected. And most of the residents that we spoke to today had their focus on the cleanup and also saving any type of items that they were able to save out of the rubble. They did say that obviously they needed to start thinking about the insurance, about FEMA and other steps that have to be taken. But for now, most of them were focused, of course, on coming back to their homes and starting with this cleanup process. There's a home down at the end over there that belongs to a woman in her 80s uh, named Tina that was destroyed. And she also owns a hotel that's right around the corner. The hotel has also been destroyed. I spent some time with her today talking about what's going through her mind. And this is what she had to say. You lost your home, you lost your hotel, and... It is what it is. I didn't, we didn't lose anybody, you know? It's, that's what it's all about, I guess. You can see mentally she was still processing everything that she had in front of her. And we talk about the damage to the power infrastructure. There's a utility pole here that has been affected. Power lines coming down into the ground. We see this everywhere here in Horseshoe Beach. So you can imagine how difficult it's going to be for authorities uh, to fix all of this infrastructure. There's another utility pole in front of me that's leaning, looks like it's about to fall. And, and you can see utility poles like this all across this community. Again, more of the damage to the infrastructure that still needs to be repaired. Yeah, you can just see how it's going to take a while for all of that work to be done. Um, we talk about the help that's coming in there. I know that the president is going to be in Florida tomorrow, uh, Guad. What more do we know about why the governor there, Ron DeSantis, is saying he's not going to meet with the president now, right after the president this afternoon said the two would meet? Right. So they asked the president if he would meet with Ron DeSantis, right? The president said yes. And then earlier today, uh, Ron DeSantis had said that the visit from the president would make things difficult for the recovery. Now we're hearing from a spokesperson from the governor's office that the governor has no plans to meet with President Biden. Now, the reason why they're saying is because that visit would require preparations that they say 
would interfere with the cleanup and recovery process. Think about these communities that have situations like this where the streets are lined up with rubble. Uh, the governor's office says uh, they need to bring in vehicles to clean up all of this debris. They need to continue with this recovery uh, process, as they're saying. And they believe that the president's visit would interrupt that process. At least that's what they're saying. But it's unclear then why President Biden indicated that he would meet uh, with Governor Ron DeSantis. So for now, that's the information that we have, Aaron. All right. We'll all be watching tomorrow to see exactly what. warning sirens that Maui will use to alert people about wildfires and make sure they know to evacuate in extreme threats. This after sirens were not used during the deadly wildfires that swept through historic Lahaina back in August. Now, this comes as we are seeing a lot of criticism and questions about how officials there could have prepared more or responded better to the fires that killed at least 115 people. And we should also hear from Hawaii's governor, really any minute now, we understand, who's expected to announce the number of people missing will now drop to under 50. Sam Brock is on the ground for us in Maui again tonight. Sam, uh, a new siren plan here in Maui. Bring us up to speed. What, what more are we learning about the new emergency protocols? Sure. The new protocols, Aaron, are that they will be incorporated from here on out. Previously in Hawaii or on these islands, they had not been using sirens for wildfires. Originally, they were designated for tsunamis. That is going to change, according to the interim director for the emergency management agency here in Maui. Now, or on Maui, rather. Now, as far as the, the latest numbers are concerned, the governor did just post a tweet moments ago. He said there are more than 1,000 federal officials on the ground right now. That includes urban search and rescue. He did not, however, update the figure that you just mentioned a second ago, which is to say, are we below 50 now for unaccounted for? He didn't mention anything about it, but yesterday did say it could dip below that figure. This was over a thousand only eight or nine days ago. So a lot of people are really trying to process how that would even be possible. And yes, the criticism right now when it comes to response from county officials continues to be at a fever pitch, especially after earlier this week when the mayor could not answer questions about timeline, which agencies were where and when, what kind of alerts were issued, where in fact he was throughout the course of the day, although he did update that overnight to say he was at the emergency operations center from 6.30 in the morning on August 8th, all the way through later that evening. Uh, but he did strike a tone uh, of hurt and also defensiveness in this Facebook post. Take a listen to what he said. We all champion our community's interests, our historical significance, and our cultural heritage. We will be tested as others try to divide us and even turn us against each other. Aaron, there have been some calls for his resignation. I have not heard anything to the effect that he's actually considering that or any other public official for that matter. But certainly there's been a lot of conversation right now about how the people here were failed. And we know that uh, Speaker McCarthy is actually going to be on the ground tomorrow on a fact-finding tour to assess the federal response as well to the disaster here in Maui, on Maui. And that's the very latest with where we stand. You know, Sam, I want to ask you, too, about how people are, are holding up there, right? I mean, I understand that there's going to be a statewide vigil today for people who were killed in the fires there. Can you give us a sense of how people are doing, how people are recovering, how people are handling the information that they're getting or not getting in, in some cases? Sure. Housing is so important, Aaron, and I'm talking to folks I'd actually circled back with or originally met earlier in the week, and they tell me they are grateful right now to learn that they're going to be able to stay in their short-term housing. And partly this is because of FEMA assistance, partly this is because of how resolute the, the governor has been here about making sure people will have some place to go. And so for at least six months, but really more like nine plus, these 6,000 displaced families will have a place over their heads. And part of that, of course, is going to be assisted by all this money coming in from OPA and The Rock. They just established a donation there. So that's all very powerful. And as far as what happened today, starting at sunrise, I would want there was a vigil and ceremonies and prayers that were given out on the beach, and this was going on across the islands. You know, we really saw these incredibly moving images, and that will continue at churches and businesses and all sorts of places where people congregate throughout the day as the folks here are trying to still digest what happened. It felt like three weeks ago, a lifetime ago, and like it could have just been yesterday. But the pain is so visceral and so acute, it's going to take a long time to get over that. 
It is beautiful, though, to see how people have tried to come together to support each other in any and every way they can. Sam Brock for us, live in Maui tonight. Sam, thank you. Well, Ohio police today releasing new body cam video of the moment officers shot and killed a pregnant black woman in her car. Her family calling this incident a, quote, gross misuse of power and authority. Officers approached 21-year-old Takaya Young outside a grocery store for allegedly stealing. They told her to get out of her car multiple times, and eventually Young starts moving her car toward an officer who was standing in front of it. Now, we are going to show you the video of that moment here in just a second. We do want to warn you, though, it may be difficult to watch. Out of the car. Now, moments later, the officer, one of the officers shoots at Young, and seconds later, her car hits the grocery store's wall. Officers then broke Young's car window to get her out and to give her medical aid, police have said. Now, Young's family wants the officer involved here to be charged for Young and her unborn daughter's deaths. Maura Barrett is joining us now from our Chicago newsroom. Maura, uh, we know the officer who fired the shot here is on administrative leave right now. The Ohio Bureau of Investigation, uh, criminal investigation, is looking into this case, which is standard. What more is the police department saying about this video they've released today? Well, Aaron, the police department is recognizing this, calling it a tragedy. And so they are understanding that the family is very upset and they've wanted to work around uh, a lot of potential concerns that the family might have had leading up to this body cam video. That's why they had the family uh, view it before it was released to the public. But it did take just over a week for them to be able to have the video ready for even the family to view. And they said in a statement today when they released the video that they referenced uh, the redaction process that's necessary, the legal review that goes on with the, these videos does take some time. They are a smaller department, this suburb just outside of Columbus. And so that's something they wanted to acknowledge and wanted to provide that extra context. But with the release of the video, they also put out uh, their use of force policy, basically establishing that police officers are given this, po this use of force policy in order to justify when use of force is necessary if they're facing a deadly action in terms of a gun, a firearm, or a vehicle. And that is what happened here. We saw that officer get in front of the vehicle. And so it seems like they're trying to get out ahead of explaining a possible defense. But they acknowledge that there might be lawsuits filed. The investigation is ongoing. And so they have to remain a pretty tight lipped uh, from here on out, Aaron. You mentioned more that the family, the young family, uh, watched the body cam video before it was released to the public. Uh, what are they saying today? How are they dealing with all that's happened? Well, again, they're calling this an abuse of power. They're seeing that uh, Takaya Young's death was avoidable after seeing the video, and so they're understandably distraught. They said that they want justice and accountability for both Takaya and her unborn daughter. And I want to read you a bit of their statement that they released after viewing the video. They said that it goes beyond the obvious policy violations that occurred, uh, and they're calling it a criminal act. They're calling for that swift indictment. Now, as you mentioned, the investigation has been turned over to the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and we'll have to wait for any formal lawsuits to be filed. We do know the family will be speaking with the press after the holiday weekend, Aaron. All right, Maura Barrett for us tonight. Maura, thank you. And tonight, a uh, convicted murderer is on the loose after escaping from a Pennsylvania prison, and police say he is extremely dangerous. A manhunt is underway now for Danilo Cavacante. He, is a, he escaped from prison just days after being given a life sentence for killing his ex-girlfriend. He's also wanted in connection with a 2017 murder in Brazil, where he is originally from. I want you to hear the Chester County, Pennsylvania DA earlier today. We believe that he is still in the general area. There is no evidence at this time to suggest that anyone has helped facilitate this escape or is assisting him at this time. We believe that he is hiding somewhere locally and that he is alone. A $10,000 reward is being offered for any information that leads to his capture. Stephen Romo joins me now. Stephen, we know that this has been a full court press, local, state, federal authorities all out looking for this guy now. The DA's office says that they're using every tool available to find Cavalcante. What exactly does that mean? Lay out this search for us. Yeah, hey, Aaron, they're really just hitting 
how dangerous they believe Cavalcante actually is. They're using drones, they're using helicopters, they're using dogs now to go out and try to find him. As we heard in that soundbite from the DA there in Chester County, they believe he's somewhere in that area hiding, potentially in a property around that area. They're asking homeowners nearby to keep a lookout if they see anything, a missing bicycle, missing clothes, anything like that, to contact authorities immediately. That is their biggest fear right now. They do say they believe he is alone right now, and they think that he's heading south, trying to get to Mexico. We see uh, these latest photos we have of him. He was seen walking about a mile away from that jail about an hour after he disappeared. He was last seen around 8.50 a.m. on Thursday. He's uh, five foot tall, around 120 pounds, but they say not to let his smaller stature make you think that he's not dangerous. He's accused, and he's actually been convicted just last week of the brutal killing of his girlfriend back in 2021, a stabbing death in front of her two children, ages four and seven years old. And they say that happened because his girlfriend found out he was wanted for murder in Brazil. They say he is very dangerous, Aaron. So, Stephen, at this point, what do we know about how he has escaped, if anything? What's the prison saying? Yeah, we've actually been trying to get more information about that. We asked yesterday and today, and so far, they're not saying how he escaped. It's a question many people have because there are other inmates in that facility. Right now, they really are just focusing on the danger that he poses at present, trying to get this photo out to people, saying to look, uh, uh, if you see him in the area, if you do spot him, Instead of approaching him, just call 911, not to even risk it, Aaron. All right, Stephen Romo for us tonight. Stephen, thank you. And coming up, take a look at this poster. It is the biggest hint yet that a really popular boy group is reuniting. We'll tell you who and what for later in The Five Things. Plus, the shocking reason why more than 100 schools in the UK will be forced to close before the start of the new term. That's just ahead. Stay with us. Today, the defense in the case of a Utah author accused of poisoning her husband says it needs more time to prepare its case before heading to a preliminary hearing. You see Corey Richens today in court there in the blue shirt as her lawyers, the prosecutors, and the judge hashed out a date to check back in for a status hearing set for early November. Now, Richens is accused of killing her husband, Eric, last March by allegedly lacing his drink with a fentanyl overdose that could have killed five people. She was arrested back in May while she had been promoting her new children's book on coping with grief. Richens has not entered a plea just yet. Civil rights attorney and former prosecutor Kristen Givens Fedden joins us now to help us understand how this is playing out at this early stage. Kristen, the defense said that it, there's a ton of evidence that they need to sift through from the state at this point, suggesting that they would be ready for a preliminary hearing early next year. Is that typical for this kind of case? What do you make of this sort of pushing out the preliminary hearing that far? Aaron, it's, it is atypical to push the preliminary hearing out that far. It is not um, abnormal for a case to take that long, particularly a first degree murder case, complex. There's a lot of forensic testing, forensic accounting. Um, and so given the multitude of evidence, it is not abnormal for a case to take that long to get to trial, but certainly to get for a preliminary hearing. It is, especially in this case where the defendant is incarcerated. So they want to try to get this case done as quickly as possible, just in the interest of justice. Um, and so it is a typical for it to take that long for a preliminary hearing. The other thing that's abnormal is that for a preliminary hearing, the burden of proof is very different. Um, and so it's not like the defendant really needs to put on a full-blown defense because the prosecution's burden is so low. They don't need to prove their evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. So the defense just needs to kind of poke some holes and find out more evidence. But that's basically what why it's taking so long is probably the complexities of the case. Yeah, complex indeed. We appreciate you helping us understand exactly what's playing out at this early stage. Kristen gibbons Fedden, thank you. Let's head to New Hampshire now, where 15-year-old Quinn Mitchell, an aspiring journalist, has made it his mission to ask presidential candidates some tough questions. There was a viral moment earlier this summer. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Florida governor and presidential hopeful Ron DeSantis, asking him a question about January 6th. That moment made headlines. A week later, when DeSantis went to a 4th of July parade in Merrimack, Quinn hoped to follow up and to apologize for any trouble that he caused. 
But as you can see in this video taken by NBC News, a man wearing a branded DeSantis 2024 hat stepped in between Florida's first family and Quinn. You see that there. Quinn also claims that somebody grabbed him by, his, uh, by the back of his shirt. DeSantis keeps marching with the parade and does turn around and say to Quinn, quote, you live in New Hampshire? Come to my next event. Quinn went to DeSantis' town hall after that on October, rather on August 19th. He tried to say hello to the governor after the event, but says that he was blocked by security. Now, the DeSantis campaign and Super PAC have not responded to our request for comment, but the occasional tough moment on the campaign trail has not dampened Quinn's enthusiasm for covering politics. NBC News 2024 campaign embed Emma Barnett has his story. What would you do to make sure that Russia does not enter your elections? Do you believe that Trump violated the peaceful transfer of power? DeSantis a few days ago or yesterday said that January 6th was not an insurrection. Do you tell me some of your thoughts on You might think the person asking these questions is a veteran reporter, but it's actually 15-year-old Quinn Mitchell. He lives in New Hampshire and has become somewhat of a staple over the past two presidential election cycles, attending over 85 different events and meeting more than 35 presidential candidates. When I learned this history was being made in my backyard, I knew I wanted to play a part in it and ask these questions. Quinn is not even old enough to vote yet, but he plays a big part in the democratic process. And I think New Hampshire is very unique in how we value retail politics. Meeting the candidates face to face gives them the chance to ask questions, tough questions. He asks real questions and he not only asks them of me, he asks them of everybody else. And that's what this process is all about. Quinn's even been mentioned in stump speeches. He's like 11 years old. Some of the candidates he's met over the years are convinced he's going to be a politician. Oh, yeah, I'd love it. Oh, you're president. Yeah, he said Joe Biden's outside. Don't say Joe who, OK? seeing Governor or Senator Quinn, and I will be completely unsurprised. But Quinn's not aiming for a governor's mansion or the halls of Congress. He wants to be a journalist. His research process is thorough. Me on my computer for hours, <laughs> just like researching candidates on C-SPAN or watching their interviews. And he's learned challenging candidates is not always well received. The kids being used as pathetic mm -hmm. political props. No, I can't. that accusation from Fox News after he asked Joe Biden a question about Trump's impeachment proceedings. Unless we're changing the voting age to 11, why is he making a pitch to little children? Wait, kids say the darndest things. Yeah, yeah that their the coach just thing. say. The irony, according to Quinn, is the adults around him often suggest asking softer questions. He says his dad floated asking Biden about his dogs. I thought of the question by myself. No help from him. Apparently, he was the person who told me to ask that question, but no, no, no. He, he told me to ask about dogs' names, um, something I could easily could just could have uh, Googled. Instead, Quinn is old school. He reads books written by the candidates. Many of them are now signed. Does reading these books help you think of questions before going to all of the town halls? Oh, absolutely. It gives me a lot of great ideas, and it also helps me you know, understand their character or, and their past offices, what policies they set forth and what they stand for. He also collects posters, yard signs, and signatures. Abedo, Elizabeth Warren. In 2019, he got most of the presidential candidates to sign this T-shirt. And back in April, he got Trump to sign a MAGA hat. Quinn is hoping to cross his 100th campaign event before the New Hampshire primaries. What are you going to do to celebrate the 100th? <laughs> Probably cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you must be so excited to turn 18. I, I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to voting for the first time. I think it's 2026. Emma Barnett, Walpole, New Hampshire, NBC News. And we understand that Quinn is also going multi-platform. He just started a podcast to cover the New Hampshire primaries. Our thanks to campaign embed Emma Barnett for that report. All right, let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the once popular YouTuber who gave parenting advice has been charged with six felony counts of child abuse. Officials say Ruby Frankie's 12-year-old son climbed out of a window and ran to a neighbor's house asking for food and water. A neighbor apparently saw duct tape on his ankles and wrists, and he went to the hospital. Authorities described the child as malnourished. Another child was found in similar condition in that house. Two other kids are in Child Protective Services custody now. Number two, former Proud Boys leader Ethan Nordine was sentenced to 18 years in prison for his role in the Capitol riot. That ties the record for the longest sentence in the January 6th attack. 
And earlier today, Dominic Pozzola, a proud boy who smashed a Capitol window with a stolen police ride shield, was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He yelled, Trump won, as he walked out of the courtroom. Former top Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarrio is set to be sentenced next Tuesday. Number three, this is the Pentagon's new website that's meant to be a one-stop shop for all things UFO. The Pentagon said it'll share declassified info, including photos and videos. It'll have information on resolved cases as well and a tool for government employees to make reports. Number four, Atlanta Braves star Ronald Acuna Jr. had a real home run day. He got married in the morning yesterday, and then he hit a grand slam at night. It made him the first MLB player ever with a 30-60, 30, 30 home runs and 60 steals in a season. Number five, we know that Backstreet's back. Well, is NSYNC also coming back? Fans think we might get a new NSYNC song after seeing the trailer and the poster for the new Trolls movie starring Justin Timberlake. Look at it. They say this Trolls poster spotted in New York City looks like a whole lot of the N in, in, in the NSYNC lo uh, logo. A lot of people who like their music are excited to see these guys maybe do a new song in their 40s and 50s, but it could be good music. Coming up. Should you pay off your student loans or hold off what you need to know before payments start back up? Plus, why India is worried that monkeys could ruin the G20 summit there. That's a bit later in the global. Brand new jobs report just into us today showing a still resilient labor market. The U.S. adding more jobs than expected in August, and it's got the White House celebrating president claiming we are in one of the strongest job growth periods ever. Listen. Some experts said to get inflation under control, we needed higher unemployment and lower wages. But I've never thought that was the problem. Too many people are having a job or that working people were making too much money. But it's not all good news. Take a look at this. The unemployment rate is now at 3.8 percent, up from the last report and the highest since February of last year. Brian Chung is at the big board to break it all down for us now. So, Brian, what does this jobs report tell us about the economy? Well, what it tells us is that the jobs market is indeed slowing compared to at least earlier this year, but it's still chugging along at a pretty healthy clip. So let me walk you through the numbers. 187 thousand jobs. That's how many were added in the month of August. That was above the Wall Street estimates of 170,000 and above the pace that we saw of 157,000 in the month of July. Now, consider that earlier in the year, we were seeing something like 250,000 plus in a given month. So uh, economists are saying that was probably a little bit unsustainable. This is probably more consistent with a regular growing economy. But what's worth watching is that we did see the unemployment rate rise to 3.8 percent, a thread that we'll have to watch in the months to come, Aaron. And so, Brian, how does this report help us uh, be ready for or anticipate what the Fed is going to do with interest rates at, at the next meeting? Yeah, well, the central bank has been trying to lift interest rates to get ahead of high inflation. A reminder that this is the jobs report here. But what the Fed is going to be watching is this number right here, average hourly earnings growth. How much more did people get paid in August of this year compared to August of the year prior? 4.3 percent. That is the answer. And for the Fed, they're saying, OK, well, it's not zero, but this number also isn't 10 percent, in which case employers might be passing along those higher costs to consumers in the form of higher inflation. So the Fed might be looking at this number, Aaron, and going, hey, you know what? That might be a bit of a Goldilocks number. All right. We hope it's just right. Brian Chung for us tonight. <laughs> Brian, thank you. Well, nearly 44 million Americans will start to see interest pile up again on their student loans with the start of repayments just a month away. And that's because the Supreme Court blocked the Biden administration's plan to cancel nearly $1.8 trillion in federal debt. You can see how that interest is driving up the, uh, the burden for Americans, really. Fifteen years ago, the debt load was something like $600 billion. Well, now it is three times that, not keeping pace with the number of borrowers. So now the White House is working on new ways to come up with forgiveness, including targeting smaller groups and trying to lessen the burden on others. Shaquille Brewster joining me now. So, Shaq, uh, walk us through these other plans the Biden administration is working through right now. How are they going to help borrowers? Well, Aaron, we're talking about a plan that, yes, is targeted. It's not that widespread forgiveness that the Supreme Court struck down in June, but it's impacting a lot of people in 
forgiving loans for hundreds of thousands of people. What are we talking about? It's a proposal uh, that's been called the one-time adjustment by the administration. Essentially, they have a plan to forgive loans uh, for people who have been paying for, you see there on your screen, 20 to 25 years. Uh, about 800,000 Americans qualified for this. That forgives about $40 billion of debt. And what they did with this adjustment is they gave credit to borrowers for a late or partial plan payments, and they also gave credit for time in which borrowers had their loans uh, in forbearance. Uh, they essentially recalculated it to allow this forgiveness. I want you to listen to what one person told me about the forgiveness she received. I'm not so pressured to pay my bills that I have. I can start budgeting a way to get a car um, since I've never owned a car in my entire life. She saw her account balance go from 40000 to zero. There are opponents. There are already lawsuits uh, on, working their way through the court system right now. But even those who are launching the lawsuit saying that this program is unlawful or unconstitutional are saying that they doubt that a court would undo the forgiveness that was already provided. You know, Shaq, what about the millions of other people who have loans out there? What do experts recommend they do? Should they pay off their loans if they can? Should they hope the Biden administration is going to come up with another plan that will be for them? Yeah, the Biden administration actually announced a new plan just last month. It's called the SAVE plan. It's an income-driven repayment plan. And what it does is it caps the minimum payment that borrowers have to have from 10% of your discretionary income to 5% of your discretionary income. For many borrowers, that makes their mandatory payment $0 a month. And you see there's some opportunities for early forgiveness there. To apply for that and to see other opportunities, other programs that are out there from the federal government, you can go to studentaid.gov slash save and see what's right for you. Aaron. All right, Shaq Brewster with us tonight. Thank you, Shaq. Well, NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our foreign desk has done it for you. We call this segment The Global. Out of Hong Kong, most of the region shut down because of a typhoon making landfall, landfall early Saturday. Classes, flights all canceled. Many workers stayed home. Hong Kong issued the strongest typhoon warning there is in that area, and officials are flagging that serious flooding could happen in coastal areas. From the United Kingdom, the British government telling more than 100 schools to keep at least some of their buildings closed just days before the new school year starts. That's because of concerns about crumbling concrete. The school minister there told the BBC that a beam collapse over the summer made people question whether this certain kind of concrete used in some buildings is safe. School administrators are figuring out where to put students. Some are going to turn to online learning. And out of India, as the G20 summit approaches, officials in New Delhi are worried about monkeys wreaking havoc across the city. They run across the roads without warning, apparently. Often they attack people in the streets. The city's solution? Putting up life-sized cutouts of another type of primate to scare the real monkeys away. Officials are also having people copy the sounds of the animals to make it seem like they are alive and moving. Okay, coming up. How the popularity of new weight loss drugs like Wagovi and Ozempic are changing the economy of an entire country. Plus, we talk a lot about Texas's fragile power system, but a big reason there haven't been any large outages this summer might just shock you. That's just ahead. Stick around. Now we want to bring you today's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. It has been a summer of record-breaking temperatures and constant heat waves. And in Texas, that state has seen some of the worst of it, ending just the, uh, just ending the hottest August in that state's history. And with the record heat came record demand for power, as you might imagine. But the state didn't have any widespread power outages. One of the reasons for that may actually surprise you. NBC's Priscilla Thompson reports. In Kaufman, Texas, next to one of the oldest crops in our nation, a new harvest is on the horizon. Texas is the biggest oil producing state in the country, but you might be surprised to hear it's now also a big leader in renewable energy. When people ask me what I do, I love to tell them that I'm a farmer. 
And then, you know, a lot of times that prompts a question, well, what do you farm? And I say, the sun. David Fulkerson manages this nearly 1,200-acre Enel Green Power solar farm near Dallas. How many homes can this operation power? So we can produce up to 180 megawatts, which is about 36,000 homes. The Lone Star State is now the leading producer of wind energy in the U.S. and second only to California in solar energy. Over the past decade, wind energy production here has increased by more than 234 percent. Solar by nearly 14,000 percent. And it's expected to double again in the next two years. So what's fueling the growth here in Texas? So many people are moving to Texas, which gives easy expansion for solar and wind. Texas runs its own power grid with lots of flat, windy, sunny land and federal tax incentives, experts say, making it ripe for a renewable energy boom. How important is renewable energy in Texas? That grid diversity is what prevents outages and loss of power for people's homes. Crucial during the summer of unrelenting heat, which fueled historic demand on the Texas power grid, setting 10 all-time high records since the final days of June. Despite the unprecedented demand, Texas hasn't experienced widespread outages, which hasn't always been the case. Millions of Texans are in their homes without power, and it is very cold there. So what's changed? Since the winter freeze in 2021, the power grid has been winterized, and more wind and solar farms have opened shop. The solar panels help capture the power, but it's really the battery storage system that can be one of the last lines of defense against a possible power grid failure. Texas is in much better position now than it was a couple years ago, but we always have risk. Dr. Michael Weber is a professor of energy resources and studies clean energy policy at UT Austin. He says that the incredible growth in renewables in Texas comes despite some serious political headwinds. I've always been very pro oil and gas. Texas is going to protect the oil and gas industry. While most states and regions and countries are trying to move away from fossil fuels, Texas is actively subsidizing natural gas. Even so, about 35% of the state's electricity now comes from wind and solar. Is the idea that one day 100% of our energy would come from wind and solar alone? Not necessarily. What can happen is solar and wind can still grow, but ultimately you want a diverse grid system where you have wind, solar, battery storage, and other traditional methods. Ushering in the dawn of a new day across Texas's energy landscape. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News, Kaufman, Texas. And Priscilla actually joins us live now. Uh, Priscilla, listening to the piece there, you mentioned the political headwinds for, for wind and solar for that industry uh, there in Texas, but you also talked about the storage issue there. There are some potential challenges with storing the power that's generated, right? Right, Aaron, and that's something that our expert mentioned. He said it would be incredibly difficult to run a grid 100% on wind and solar power because of the amount of battery storage that would be possible and the enormous amount of space that would be needed in order to store those batteries, as you saw in the piece. Now, Anel tells us that they have added five battery storage facilities this summer. They're planning to add another six within the year and say that they'll continue to build that out. But of course, the question is, what happens when you run out of space. Aaron? Yeah, it is a big question, but this is the wave of the future, and so they'll have to figure it out uh, in order to, to keep moving forward. Priscilla Thompson for us in Texas tonight. Thank yeah. you, Priscilla. Well, a company most people had never heard of a few years ago, Novo Nordisk, is now the most valuable public company in Europe. Why? Well, the Danish company makes Ozempic and Wagovi, the two highly popular weight loss drugs that are helping in the fight against diabetes, obesity, heart attacks, strokes now. Economists telling the New York Times that Novo Nordisk is responsible for just about all of Denmark's economic growth and may even be helping keep interest rates down there. Matt Bradley joins us now. Uh, he's in, in, in London for us today. So, Matt, Novo Nordisk riding a wave, really, of demand for these highly effective drugs for diabetes and for weight loss. That sent earnings and shares to record highs there. Uh, help us understand exactly what's playing out here for, for the company and for Denmark and, and how this is sort of dictating what happens when you look at the numbers or how you look at the numbers there for the economy in that country. 
Well, yeah, it's a question of how you look at the numbers. You mentioned that it was actually, and this is just breaking news just today, that Nova Nordics surpass France's LVMH, and you know them because of Louis Vuitton and, De, and uh, Dior, as the largest, the largest company in terms of market capitalization. Now, another interesting statistic here, Aaron, uh, you know, Nova Nordics is actually larger in market capitalization than Denmark's economy is in gross national product. So those are two different, different indicators, of course, but it really just goes to show that Nova Nordis has taken over in certain ways the, Den the Danish economy. It hasn't, it hasn't really taken over the Danish economy, but it has been responsible solely for mm. all of the growth in really the last couple of years. We just saw that growth in uh, the Danish economy has reached nearly 2% over the last year. Nova Nordis and the pharmaceutical industry around that, which is much smaller than this company, is it accounts for about 1.7% of that nearly 2%. So as you can see, Without the pharmaceutical industry in Denmark, there would be no growth. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing to think about one industry or one company being tied to all of that growth for an entire country. Are there uh, any drawbacks of having a country's economic growth so tied to one industry like this? Yeah, it's a really good question, Aaron. I mean, when you look at places like in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia or some of these other Gulf countries, you know, their rentier economies, they're based entirely on oil, and they've been doing very well, making their populations extremely wealthy for generations. But that's not really the same for Novo Nordisk and for these drugs, because at some point, as with all drugs, they're going to go generic. Anybody's going to be able to make these drugs, and then anybody's going to be able to profit off of them, and that's a big risk, and that means that the economy is going to be suffering. You can look at neighboring Finland, where there was Nokia. Remember, we all used to have Nokia cell phones, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, we didn't. We got iPhones. Well, the economy of Finland single-handedly was buoyed by those Nokia phones that were purchased all throughout the world, and then suddenly, when people stop buying Nokia phones, the economy, the entire economy of that entire country sank along with Nokia. And that's something, uh, that's a real issue that a lot of people don't want to see happening in Denmark. Yeah, something to watch closely here for Denmark uh, going into the future. Matt Bradley for us tonight. Matt, appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, the shifting nature of college sports and why one of the biggest and most powerful leagues on the East Coast is adding teams from all the way across the country. Stick around, that's next. Well, one of the biggest and most powerful college sports leagues, the Atlantic Coast Conference, today adding teams from, well, the Pacific Coast. Today, the ACC formally admitting Stanford, the University of California, Berkeley, and Southern Methodist University in Dallas to its roster. That's going to be starting next year. You see the map here highlighting just how far away these newcomers are to the rest of the conference, all of which are in the Eastern Time Zone. But in a statement, the chair of the ACC's board of directors saying the move will strengthen this league now and in the future. The move is also effectively the final nail in the coffin for the Pac-12 conference, the country's oldest, because as you see here, 10 of its 12 members have abandoned ship over the last year. Why? Because of how money and TV deals are rapidly changing the college sports landscape. Noah Pransky is all over this for us tonight. So, uh, Noah, for folks who need to learn a little bit more, give us a better understanding about why college sports are, are shifting so much right now. Yeah, you probably won't even recognize the conferences that you grew up watching, but it's all about chasing the football dollar. Um, Realignment's been happening for a few decades, but right now, really just unprecedented amount of it because there's consolidation, and consolidation has meant leverage when it comes to negotiating TV deals. And you have a lot of conferences consolidating down right now into four big conferences, pretty much, although it may continue to shrink from there. But right now, we're looking at four major football conferences, and I want to show you a different kind of map here that can show you exactly how this is playing out. We're going to visualize the states that are represented by the four big football conferences here. The Atlantic Coast Conference, as you mentioned, Aaron, now including West Coast teams, of course. The Southeastern Conference, SEC, now up to 16 teams, including teams like Missouri, which are neither South nor Eastern. The Big 12, no longer 12 teams. They're going to 16 with the addition of Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, and Colorado. And then the Big 10, which hasn't actually been 10 teams since 1990, is going to 18 teams soon. And frankly, they're unlikely to stop there. It's tough, Aaron, on those of us who are fans, but it's also tough on the student athletes who are going to have to do a lot more travel moving forward.
Yeah, I bet. Uh, but, you know, there's another way to think about this. You mentioned the fact that a lot of this seems to be about football, right, and football dollars. But there are a lot of other sports, a lot of other athletes who are not going to be big profiters off of their name, image, and likeness using the rules in the same way as some of the football players, athletes who, who don't just play on Saturdays for big TV audiences. What about them? They're going to be impacted here. So there's like two big concerns, right? We talk about revenue sports, which are football and men's basketball typically, and then non-revenue sports or your Olympic sports. And there's concern that as we put more attention on football, and athletes getting paid is a good thing in a lot of ways, but also that's taking some money out of the other operations of the sport. The more athletes get paid, maybe the less that goes to the school. And that means there is less to fund a lot of these non-revenue Olympic sports. So a lot of the athletes in sports like swimming, track and field, basically, all the sports that we use college NCAA system to fund our Olympic teams to train them, there's concern that that money might not be there moving forward. All right, Noah Pransky, thank you. That is a wrap for this hour. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.